Father, we come to you this morning. We thank you, Lord, for everything you have provided by your grace. We thank you for sending your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to be our Savior. We thank you for the gift of eternal life. We thank you, Lord, for the privilege of serving the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Help us to continue to take in your word and grow in your grace. And we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. This morning we're going to examine the... Uh, Battle of Jericho in Joshua chapter 6. So if you have your Bibles, let's uh, turn to Joshua chapter 6. Joshua chapter 6. Very familiar story, probably in Sunday school. You were taught this over and over about how the walls came tumbling down. <laughs> and Joshua defeated uh, the enemies in Jericho. But hopefully this morning I, I found some things I've never seen before in the text as I studied about the uh, history of Jericho and, and some of the archaeology. Um, hopefully you'll see some new things in the text you haven't seen before. But let's begin by reading the first five verses of the chapter in Joshua 6. Now Jericho was securely shut up because of the children of Israel. None went out and none came in. And the Lord said to Joshua, See, I've given Jericho into your hand, its king, and the mighty men of valor. You shall march around the city, all you men of war. You shall go around the city once. This you shall do six days. And seven priests shall bear seven trumpets of ram's horn before the ark. But the seventh day you shall march around the city seven times, and the priests shall blow the trumpets. It shall come to pass, when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, and when you hear the sound of the trumpet, that all the people shall shout with a great shout. Then the walls of the city will fall down flat, and the people shall go up, every man straight before him. Now, uh, what do we know about the uh, city of Jericho? Archaeology has uncovered some findings in Jericho. Let's take a look at where Jericho is located. The children of Israel were in Shittim before they crossed the Jordan River. And as the text says, Jordan River divided all the way up to Adam. Adam is not the historical Adam, but the city Adam, which is about a 20-mile upstream town from the Dead Sea. So quite a large path for the children of Israel to cross over. And uh, as we stated before, this is a duplication of the miracle. Remember, the Red Sea divided. And now under Joshua, we have a similar miracle that occurred. And then their base of operation became Gilgal. Gilgal was the base of operation for the attack on Jericho. We see that in the prior chapter in Joshua chapter 5. Joshua chapter 5, uh, the children of Israel in verse 10. Take a look at that text. Joshua 5, 10. They were camped in Gilgal. Now the children of Israel camped in Gilgal and kept the Passover on the 14th day of the month at twilight on the plains of Jericho. Now this map really doesn't show the elevation or contour, but this following map does. And you can see that this Jordan Rift Valley is a level area. And then we have an increase in elevation on the edge of Jericho going up, up to eventually Jerusalem. There's a road here, by the way, from the southern part of Jericho that runs all the way through these hills on into Jerusalem. So the elevation begins to go up at this point. And what's interesting, when we find the account of when the spies went into the city, um, we know that Rahab protected the spies and sent them out, and they hid for a few days in the hills. And Jordan, Jericho's right here, but you can see the elevation right here, Right next to Jericho, they went up into the hills and hid. So you can see that with the contour in this map uh, of Jericho. So the base of operation here was two miles away. Gilgal's not very far, but uh, two miles from Jericho. And it was from there that they went on to attack Jericho. Now, the uh, mound of Jericho discovered... Uh, by several digs uh, in biblical archaeology. The Mound of Jericho, or Tell, usually in, in the scripture, when they excavate a city or a location, they call it a Tell. A mound is a Tell. 
uh, and this was surrounded by a great earthen rampart or embankment with a stone retaining wall at its base. So here's this stone retaining wall right here, and then we have a wall here, and then another wall up here. So the retaining wall was some 12 to 15 feet high. On top of that was a mud brick wall six feet and about 20 to 26 feet high. At the crest of the embankment was a similar mud brick wall whose base was roughly 46 feet above ground. So if you take from this point where this guy is standing all the way up to this area right here, we have an elevation of 46 feet. So it wasn't simply uh, just a flat area with a wall around the city. We, in Sunday school, we normally depict, you know, this you know, flat area where just high wall and it, it came down, but it was much more involved than that. It was really a fortification. Jericho was a fortified city, and uh, it would take months to attack the city in the normal fashion. Uh, but here, the, uh, the uh, secondary wall, the main city wall, is 46 feet above this ground level. Now, uh, this is what loomed high above the Israelites as they marched around the city each day for seven days. Humanly speaking, it was impossible for the Israelites to penetrate the impregnable bastion of Jericho. So we see the difficulty there from a logistic standpoint, point of view. It's not some simple little lean-to or small little wall around a, a city. Now here's another artist's Im image of the walls. You can see this double wall here. Uh, archaeologists have uncovered the uh, city of Jericho and you see an outer city wall which was depicted and then higher up in elevation up to 46 feet high from the area where they marched around we have this inner city wall and you had the tower here and uh, then you had the residential area where there were homes literally on the wall and more than likely this is where Rahab the harlot was located right on the outside having a house right on the outside wall area and uh, later on, archaeologists have un uncovered that the city walls fell, but there was a section of the city wall that didn't. And it's amazing how this is verified by biblical archaeology. And uh, a lot of individuals speculate that may have been the area where Rahab was located that didn't fall in the uh, Battle of Jericho. <coughs> now, uh, Jericho was controlled by, uh, I think this is a little off center, but Jericho was controlled here by two main accesses into the hill country, the road to Bethel and Ai and the road to Jerusalem. So you see this road here, you see Jericho here and increase in elevation and you're going along the plain and then you go up into the mountains, this area and on the way to Ai right here. So we have a road going this way from Jericho and then a southern route, another road that went into the hills on the way to the city of Jerusalem. So Jericho was at a strategic location. And if you conquer Jericho, you conquer the access point to Ai and Jerusalem from that direction. So it was very important strategically. Now we're gonna deal with uh, some things concerning biblical archeology. span So I'm gonna read several things from uh, beginning Zondermann Handbook of Biblical Archeology. span This is a recent work that came out with uh, Randall Price. And uh, you're, if you're familiar with uh, his work on the temple, uh, and he uh, has written a lot of uh, different articles and books related to the biblical temple, the future <laughs> temple, that will be built in the millennial in the uh, tribulation period. Uh, and then Wayne House, uh, two conservative scholars that compiled uh, this handbook on biblical archaeology. So the various sites in the Bible, uh, you have that information. Now, uh, he says this, although early excavations by Ernest Sellin and Carl Watzinger in 1907-1908, that's when it was Jericho was originally excavated. And then the main individual, John Garstang, in the work in 1930-36, they produced evidence that the excavators felt was supportive of the biblical account. So 
originally when it was excavated, we had direct proof that the walls did indeed fall down. There were several things. The city was set on fire, and uh, it was during that time period that the Bible describes. And there are several things that they found that verified the Bible. Unfortunately, there was a follow-up by a lady named Catherine Kenyon. She did some further excavations in the 50s, 52 to 58, and published her work 30 years later. She concluded that an attack had only occurred in the Middle Bronze period, and uh, that the city therefore had been destroyed some 150 years before the time that the biblical account puts Joshua and Canaan. Uh, so she's challenging the biblical record. And so most college students, when they're exposed to you know archaeological accounts of Jericho, would probably be exposed, well, see, Catherine Kenyon refuted the Bible. No one ever was in that area for this period of time. But hold the phone. <laughs> Wait, uh, that's not the final conclusion. Brian Wood published uh, uh, samples and challenged this assumption. We're going to see how she misdated some of these things in uh, her work. And so there's proof that the account later on did occur and biblical days. So you have to be careful in some of secular archaeology that uh, they may not have all the facts in. And of course, they're only basing evidence on a limited amount of facts. Um, but it was proven early on, certainly Garstang's work has not been really refuted. Uh, Randall Price brings this out. Now, uh, there was uh, further work. There was uh, the uh, Italian-Palestinian team did find some late bronze materials in the tombs of the period four, late bronze age. This would be the period, late bronze age one, the period from 1550 to 1200 BC. And it would be the time period where Joshua went in, biblically speaking. The Exodus occurred around 1446 BC. So that would be the period of time when Joshua went in. And uh, this was located northwest of the Tel, or the mound. This material consisted of Egyptian amulets inscribed with the names of pharaohs from 1500 to 1386 BC. It's interesting. And where would they get that? <laughs> from Egypt, right? Indicating that the cemetery was in use during that time. So this was refuting uh, Catherine Kenyon's uh, position. There was evidence that these by these Egyptian amulets within the cemetery that this area was in use during the biblical time when Joshua went in. Perhaps some of these amulets were part of the treasures of Egypt. It's interesting. Exodus 12, 35 and 36. Remember, they spoiled the Egyptians when they left Egypt, and they probably could have, could have ended up here in this area. Uh, he said this is probably a part of the treasures of Egypt that the Bible states were given to the departing Hebrews by the Egyptian populace. Now, uh, I don't know if you could read this. I'll read it for you by Gleason Archer. Gleason Archer has written uh, over 20, 30 years ago a book him, uh, called um, Handbook of Bible Difficulties, something like that. And uh, he addresses so-called contradictions in the Bible. And uh, he really deals with this uh, objection to Catherine Kenyon's work. Uh, Gleason Archer was a very brilliant man, by the way. You know, I don't know multiple languages that he uh, studied and, and uh, could read. Um, I think of 18 different languages. Uh, he graduated from Harvard uh, and uh, a very brilliant individual. And so he says this, Catherine Kenyon's later investigation at Tel El Sultan that would be the area where Jericho was, led her to question Gar Stang's identification of the collapsed wall within City 4. Because the pot shirts found in the earth field, uh, earth field, those walls were from a period centuries earlier than 1400 BC. Now, the soundness of this deduction is open to question, however, because of the same phenomenon that would be observable with the walls of Avila in Spain or Carcinon in France were to be tra leveled by an earthquake in our own generation. Since those walls were erected several centuries ago, 
The Kingon criterion would compel us to believe that they must have fallen centuries ago because they would, of course, contain no inter internal evidence of 20th century construction. But no discovery of Kingon or Vinson or any other excavator at that site who came there with a prior commitment to a 1250 date for the Israelite conquest of Canaan have ever been able to shake the objective findings of Garstang and his team in regard to the scarabs and sherds found. Now what he's saying here is, uh, if you have a current wall that was built originally two or 300 years ago, maybe you have stone from that you know, period, uh, and that wall falls down, your conclusion would be that the wall fell down 230 or 300 years, 200 or 300 years prior. Not necessarily so. It was built 200 or 200, 300 years prior, and it fell down later. So that's what he's saying here with her assumption that because materials were from an earlier period, uh, when the walls fell down, that um, they were not there during that time frame that the Bible says. And certainly that's a logical fallacy uh, that, that uh, Gleason Archer mentions or brings out. Now, a uh, summary of what, is found, what was found there uh, supporting the Bible account, biblical account, are seven things. Seven things that verify the biblical account in Joshua 6. Jericho was a fortified city in the 15th century B.C. Uh, that was certainly found there in the archaeological excavations at Jericho. Also verified there by biblical archaeology, the city was destroyed by fire, which clearly indicates uh, in Joshua 6.24. Let's take a look at that text. Joshua 6, 24, but they burned the city and all that was in it with fire. Only the silver and gold and the vessels of bronze and iron they put into the treasury of the house of the Lord. This is verified uh, by biblical archaeology. The fortification walls collapsed in Joshua 6, verse 20. So the people shouted when the pre priests blew the trumpets and it happened when the people heard the sound of the trumpet and the people shouted with a great shout that the walls fell down flat. And the people went into the city, every man straight before him, they took the city. Verified by archaeology. Uh, the destruction was in the time of harvest due to grain shortage. And they found these jars with grain in them. And what's interesting is they had a great supply of food in the city. They could have withstood uh, an attack for quite a period of time. They found these jars that were not even used, by the way, full of grain, which shows that what happened happened quickly. The siege on the city occurred quickly versus over a long period of time. Now, the grain stored in the city was not consumed, I mentioned that, indicating a shorter siege. Uh, they've demonstrated by finding these jars of grain full. Um, the grain was never used by the inhabitants or invaders in Joshua 6, 17, and 18. And then number seven, the walls were leveled as part of the destruction in Joshua 6, 20. All these things have been verified by archaeology. So uh, I like the text, let God be true and every man a liar. Uh, the word of God stands verified. Uh, now, here's Randall Price pointing to evidence of the cities being burnt. He points to a layer there. You can see it's charred, that black area. Uh, holding, he's there holding a mud brick and pointing at destruction level at Jericho and the Kenyan Trench, the same site as the trench of the back of her photo. So he's there pointing to that layer that shows that the city was burnt at some point. So there's the evidence pointing right to it today of what the Bible verifies. All right, now let's go into the text here. Let's go back to uh, Joshua chapter 6. And uh, let's begin here in verse 1. 
So Jericho was securely shut up because of the children of Israel. None went out, none came in. Now, the reason for this was the spies came in and they are aware of Israel's presence. So what they basically did was shut down the city. <laughs> they were on lockdown. <laughs> we hear about COVID lockdown. Jericho was in lockdown. No one could come in, no one could come out. The city was, uh, you know, very secure. And uh, then the Lord said to uh, Joshua, see, I've given Jericho into your hand. It's king and the mighty men of valor. Now, who's speaking at this point? Uh, the Lord is speaking to Joshua. But if we go back to the prior chapter, who is speaking to Joshua? We had the commander of the army of the Lord in verse 14. And we have this theophany, the pre-incarnate appearance of Christ. Joshua fell down on his face and worshiped showing that this is not simply an angel, but deity. When you see the word angel of the Lord, it doesn't mean an angel that's created. It means a messenger of the Lord. And uh, this is a theophany uh, or a Christophany, a pre-incarnate appearance of Christ. Then the commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, take your sandals off your foot for the place where you stand is holy. Remember, same uh, command was given to Moses when he was in the mount. Uh, therefore, this is a Christophany. Now, when we continue, remember no chapter divisions when the Bible was originally written. Who's speaking now? The Lord now is addressed, saying, is speaking now to Joshua. So most scholars connect uh, what, he, what is stated in verse 2 with the theophany of chapter 5. So this is the Lord showing that uh, this is the Lord speaking. Uh, the Lord was speaking in chapter 5, and he continues to address Joshua. Uh, he indicates that I've given Jericho into your hand. Um, so uh, this is something that the Lord's going to accomplish. This is a battle, you know, that, that uh, you know, song, the battle belongs to the Lord. And therefore, this is something that God's going to do. Obviously, they're going to obey the command of God, but uh, God's going to give them the victory here at Jericho. So verse 3, you shall march around the city to command, and all you men of war, you shall go around the city once. This you shall do for six days. So how long would it take the children of Israel to march around the city? Well, from biblical archaeology, we know that the city was about seven to nine acres, uh, and therefore to march around it would be at least uh, would take thirty minutes or less. So they would march around thirty minutes and retire that day, and the next day they march around another thirty minutes and retire. So uh, this task would have been completed quickly. You shall march around one time. And then, of course, on the seventh day, they were to march around seven times. Now, verse 4 says, The seven priests shall bear seven trumpets of ram's horn before the ark. But the seventh day you shall march around the city seven times, and the priests shall blow the trumpets. Now, what trumpets? There's different Hebrew words for trumpets, as well as in the New Testament, different Greek words for trumpets. Uh, the trumpets that are blown here were called jubilee trumpets. Jubilee trumpets. These would be trumpets that were blown with Israel's feast to proclaim the presence of God. And so these trumpets were blown, declared God's presence. Now, we'll take a look at a couple passages from, uh, first of all, Numbers chapter 10, verse 10. Numbers 10, 10. which says this, in the day of your gladness and the, your appointed feast and at the beginning of your months, you shall blow the trumpets over your burnt offerings and over the sacrifice of your peace offerings. And this shall be a memorial for you before your God. I am the Lord, your God. I am the Lord, your God. And then Leviticus 25, verse nine. Leviticus 25, verse nine.
Then you shall cause the trumpets of Jubilee to sound on the tenth day of the seventh month. On the day of atonement, you shall make the trumpet to sound throughout all your land. So these were normally trumpets that would be blown during Israel's feast, especially the Feast of Trumpets. What does this indicate? This indicate that the conquest of Jericho was not exclusively a military undertaking, but a religious one. And the trumpets declared that the Lord of heaven and earth was waving his, weaving his invisible way around this doomed city. This is a spiritual battle. This is a spiritual battle. It's not simply a normal battle as far as uh, you know, military armies against each other. Uh, but this is a spiritual endeavor. Um, think about the trumpets. I thought about the connection here. You know, we're waiting for the trumpet to sound in the church age. And uh, 1 Thessalonians 4.16 indicates that the Lord himself will descend from heaven with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. We're waiting for the Lord to announce his coming. Uh, they were announcing God's coming to defeat Jericho. And when the Lord comes for his church, he will announce his coming to rescue us and rapture us to be with him. Also, I found it interesting that as they marched around the city, they were commanded to shout. They had the battle cry. They were to shout and the walls would fall down. And again, the Lord will come with a shout and the voice of the archangel and the trump of God. So we have all those, those are two separate events, certainly biblically. Uh, I think it's significant that the Lord will announce his presence through a shout and through a trumpet as God announced his presence and defeating Jericho with a shout and the shout of the people and the trumpet blast. Now, why seven times, okay? We, we are marched around the city uh, six times, and, uh, the, or my, six days, seven times. What is significant of seven? Notice here, uh, we have that word repeated. I'll do this without creating a link. <laughs> yep, I knew it. <laughs> okay, there it is. Now, we have this word repeated here. Notice here, uh, word seven. Seven priests, verse four, shall bear seven trumpets, a ram's horn. On the seventh day, you shall march around the city seven times. Notice the number seven, repeated over and over. Now, I have to be careful when we study and examine biblical numerology. We don't want to get off into the deep end when we do biblical numerology. We want to keep it simple and straightforward because people try to well, seven divided by this, multiplied by that, da da da, means this is this is this. Wait, hold on. You'll start to allegorize the text. And we certainly don't want to allegorize the text. Uh, but it is significant that the Bible repeats that number seven. And generally speaking, in the Bible, uh, the number seven is a picture of completion uh, or perfection, the number of perfection. Uh, six is the number of man. That's why the Antichrist has. 666, six, six, one short of perfection, seven. It's the number of a man. And then completion or totality. So when we look at the number seven, generally, it speaks of completion, perfection, or totality. And so God is going to completely give them the victory. Uh, this is a number of perfection. It's amazing how many times you see the number seven in the book of Revelation. Seven seals, seven trumpets, seven bowls. You know, you have that number seven, seven churches, Revelation 2 and 3. Um, so you have that number seven repeated consistently. And so we need to make our observation when the number seven is mentioned. It's not insignificant that he told, told them to march seven times around. Now let's take a look at verse 5. Um, it shall come to pass when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, and when you hear the sound of the trumpet, that all the people shall shout, here's a shout, with a great shout, then the walls of the city will fall down flat, and the people shall go up every man straight before him. So this shout uh, is the Hebrew word, I'll spell it for you, for you, T 
E-R-U-A-H. This Hebrew word is a battle cry. So the shout would be a battle cry. What was the purpose of this? Well, the purpose of the battle cry was intended to inspire the ranks, fellow soldiers, and to demoralize the enemy. You hear about this in some of the Civil War battles. You have the yelling and shout as they go into battle to give courage to the soldiers and also to demoralize the enemy. Uh, and this is what occurred here. Now, he said that the walls will fall down flat. Um, what's interesting is not simply that the walls would topple over. We normally picture of the walls come, you know, just topple over like that, but they fell down flat straight. Um, the walls literally in the Hebrew would fall in, in its place. It come down like that. Um, the rabbis, so this is by Frutenbaum, they, Frutenbaum says, the rabbis interpret the phrase to mean that the walls did not topple, but rather they sank into the ground. So the walls just came down, sank into the ground, fell down flat. Now, verse 6 says this, Joshua, the son of Nun, called the priests and said to them, Take up the Ark of the Covenant and let seven priests bear seven trumpets of ram's horn before the Ark of the Lord. So here we have the order of procession. We have several things mentioned when following verses 6 through verse 9. Let's just read those texts and then we'll make a connection here. He said to the people, proceed and march around the city. Let him who is armed advance before the ark. So we have the ark. We have those in front of the ark, right? Let those advance in front of the ark and then the ark behind. Verse 8, so it was when Joshua had spoken to the people that seven priests bearing the seven trumpets of the ram's horn before the Lord advanced and blew the trumpets. And the ark of the Lord followed them. So had the priest out front blowing the trumpets. We have the ark behind them. And then we have the armed men who went in front of the priest. Look at verse 9. The armed men went before the priest who blew the trumpets. So we're starting to see an order of procession here. The armed men are out front. We have the priest who's who will be blowing the trumpets. Then we have the ark, which is mentioned in verse 8. And then following behind them, we have further information. Verse 9, we have a rear guard. The rear guard would come after the ark while the priest continued blowing the trumpets. Now, we put all those pieces of the puzzle together. We have this. First of all, we have the soldiers out front. Verse 9, um, we have the armed men went before the priest, so they're out front. Secondly, we have the priest behind them in verses 6, 8, and 13. So the priest came next in order behind the soldiers. And then we have the Ark of the Covenant in verses 6, 8, and 13 in the third position. So third position of order would be the Ark. Then we have more soldiers. We have a rear guard, as translated here in the New King James, uh, in verse 9. And then finally, we have the people follow them. So they came last. So we have the people in verse 7. He said to the people, proceed and march around the city. So where did they come into play? Um, Let whom, them who is armed advance before the ark of the Lord. So common, ordinary people, they would come in last in the rear. So we have the soldiers first, priest second, ark third, more soldiers behind them, verse 9, and then finally fifth, we have the people following them. So uh, going back to verse 6, we have Joshua, son of Nun, Nun, called the priest and said to them, take up the ark of the covenant, let seven priests bear seven trumpets, a ram's horn before the ark of the Lord. And then he said to the people, proceed, march around the city. Let him who is armed advance before the ark. So it was when Joshua had spoken to the people that the seven priests bearing the seven trumpets of ram's horns before the Lord advanced and blew the trumpets. The ark of the covenant of the Lord followed them. The armed men went before the priest who blew the trumpets and the rear guard came after the ark while the priest continued blowing 
the trumpets. Now verse 10, Joshua had commanded the people saying, you shall not shout or make any noise with your voice, nor shall a word proceed out of your mouth until the day I say to you, shout, then you shall shout. So basically, the procession, and if it, no one would make a word as they marched around the city, they would do so in silence. Not make any noise with your voice. And uh, we have the, I think, I thought of several verses in regard to this and how there's periods in the Bible where God is silent before he judges. In uh, Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 20, we're going to look at a couple of places. Habakkuk 2, 20. Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 20. But the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silent before him. Think about that. Let all the earth, the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silent before him. Then we have the passage uh, in Zephaniah, while you're in the Minor Prophets there. Zephaniah would be the next book. Uh, Zephaniah chapter 1, verse 7. Zephaniah 1, 7. Be silent in the presence of the Lord God. Be silent in the presence of the Lord God. For the day of the Lord is at hand. The Lord has prepared a sacrifice. He has invited his guest. I think here he's speaking of the future coming day of the Lord judgment in the book of Revelation and in that seven-year tribulation. The Lord is, uh, be silent in the presence of the Lord. The day of the Lord is at hand. And then we actually have it in one of the judgments, series of judgments in the book of Revelation, we have silence in heaven in Revelation chapter 8, verse 1. Revelation chapter 8, verse 1. When he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about a half an hour before these horrible judgments are unfolded. I think it's a sense of awe as we think about the Almighty, the omnipotent God who has the power to judge. Um, and so until they're commanded to shout, there is silence. Before the Lord judges, we see that example in Scripture. Now let's take a look at uh, verse uh, 11. So he had the ark of the Lord, he who had the ark, let's say this again. So he had the ark of the Lord circle the city, going around at once. Then they came into the camp and lodged into the camp. So again, uh, Jericho would be covered uh, about 30 minutes or less, a march, and covered around seven to nine acres. Uh, so they would uh, take the Ark of the Lord and around it one time each day uh, and go back to Gilgal. Came into the camp would be two miles back to Gilgal. And two miles up the next day, March around it again, two back, two miles up, back to Gilgal, base of operations. And keep in mind, they're going, they're marching this, they're marching around the city, going back to Gilgal. In Gilgal, next day, get up in the morning, march around the city again, go back to Gilgal. Uh, so this was going on for six days until the final seventh day. I think, why the delay? Couldn't God have done it just pff, all at once one day? I think it's so that the people will walk by faith and not by sight. Sometimes God delays his answers so that we will trust in him. Okay, he wants us to depend upon him. Do you really believe my promises? really believe my word? I want you to continue to walk by faith. And we see this in the Hebrews 11. They took this city by faith. They trust the Lord. Nothing has happened yet, God. Sometimes we're saying, where are you, Lord? Why have you done anything? March around the city another day. <laughs> Do it the next day, and the next day, and the next day, and the next day, and the next day. I'm going to give you the victory, but you have to walk by faith first. And you're not walking by sight. 
You're trusting in what I have said. The integrity of the word of God. So I think that's why the delay, why God didn't give them the victory all at once. They had to learn to trust in him and not to lean into their own understanding. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding and all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. So we have to learn how to trust and rest. You know, we, we need to understand what faith rest is all about. Trusting in him, resting in his promises, in his word. Now, let's take a look here then in uh, verses uh, 13. Joshua, uh, let's take a look at um, 12 first. Joshua rose up early in the morning. The priest took up the ark of the Lord. And seven priests bearing seven trumpets of ram's horn before the ark of the Lord went on continually and blew with the trumpets. And the ark, the armed men went before them, but the rear guard came after the ark of the Lord while the priest continued blowing the trumpets. So the only sound you could hear is a trumpet sound, and the people were quiet. And the trumpets were blown, and he marched around, and the people were, were silent. Um, now, uh, let's take a look at verse 14 then. The second day they marched around the city once and returned to the camp. So they did these six days. In uh, verse 15, it came to pass on the seventh day that they rose early, <laughs> about the dawning of the day. And um, I was up for sunrise and watched the sun come up this morning. So early in the morning, uh, they got up and marched around the city seven times in the same manner. On that day only, they marched around the city seven times. And the seventh time it happened when the priest blew the trumpets that Joshua said to the people, Shout, for the Lord has given you the city. Notice that. God. God has given you the city. Now, it's interesting, the various scripture, and I think later on, I have this in my notes, The I think four times in this text, in this chapter, he indicates it's God who is the one who's giving the city. God is the one who's doing this. The Lord is the one who's giving the victory. So the focus here is on God's uh, power, his omnipotence, his strength, and on the people. They're just obeying the orders. And God is the one who's going to give you the victory. Now, uh, verse 17, the city shall be doomed by the Lord to destruction. And all who are in it, only Rahab the harlot shall live. She and all who are with her in the house, because she hid the messengers that we sent. So Rahab will not be uh, uh, killed. She will be spared because she was a woman of faith. Uh, but the city would be doomed to destruction. And later on we'll ask, why did God do this? Why did he say destroy everyone? There's a, there is a biblical answer for that. But what we want to point out that at this point, um, there are certain uh, things that they were not to take from the city. Uh, and uh, the city will be doomed, but there's later on he mentions the accursed thing in verse 18. Uh, you by all means abstain from the accursed things, lest you become accursed when you take of the accursed things and make the camp of Israel a curse and trouble it. Uh, this is something that Achan violated as we see in the following chapter, and that's why they were defeated at Ai. Uh, they were not allowed to personally profit from the attack. Now, normally that, that is the uh, allowable, allowable in Scripture. David certainly profited and took the spoils, what we call the spoils of war. The conquering army has that right to take the spoils of war. Um, and, uh, I, you know, this is just my personal opinion, but I think when we... When in the in the um, the battle in uh, Iraq, uh, we had the right to take the resources of the oil fields because we paid for the war, and we were the victors. Uh, but normally, an army has the right to take the spoils of war. But this time, though, because of the paganization of the culture, think about the god and goddesses that were in that in that city. Uh, even though that the money itself, those idols may have been gold or silver, 
uh, they did not want anything to do. God did not want them to do with have anything to do with idolatry. And I think that's why part of the reason for the ban, uh, don't take anything that's associated with paganism, pagan clothing, pagan worship. Uh, you are, you're going to be a set apart people. And that's why uh, they were not only, you only take certain spoils for the temple treasury. We'll see certain things for the Lord, but personally, nope, don't want you to take any spoils of war at this point. Once again, this is a uh, restriction for Jericho. It wasn't always a restriction in battle. Later on, David took spoils of war. Um, verse uh, 18 says this, you by all means abstain from the accursed things, lest you become a curse when you take of the accursed things and make Israel, Israel a curse and trouble it. Let's take a look at Joshua chapter seven, verse one. Joshua seven, verse one. But the children of Israel committed a trespass regarding the accursed things. For Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of uh, Zabdi, the son of Zerah, the tribe of Judah, took of the accursed things. So the anger of the Lord burned against the children of Israel. See, this is why they were defeated. Verse 12 uh, mentions this as well, uh, the same uh, chapter. Israel is sin, uh, verse 11. Therefore the children of Israel could not stand before their enemies, but turn their backs before their enemies because they had become doomed to destruction. Uh, nor I will be with you anymore unless you destroy the accursed from among you. Uh, that had to be purged. Those individuals associated with this had to be purged from the camp of the children of Israel before God would bless them. And then verse 25 of this chapter 7. Joshua said, Why have you troubled us? The Lord will trouble you this day. So Israel stoned Achan with stones. They burned them with fire after they had stoned them with stones. So they dealt with Achan's rebellion, and then they went on to have victory uh, in the following chapter in Ai. That's why they were defeated, because they violated this clear command. Uh, Achan, he, uh, he was covetous of these things, and uh, he was judged. And by the way, the Bible does equate, in, in the New Testament, covetousness with idolatry. We're making that object of our covetousness an idol. We normally don't think, I'm not bowing down to an image or an idol, but if you have something that's so important, it's more important than God, your walk with God, uh, that's making it an idol. Covetousness is equated with idolatry. <clears throat> now, look at verse 19. They were allowed to take things that belong to the Lord. Now we go back to chapter 6, uh, verse 19. All the silver and gold and the vessels of bronze and iron are consecrated to the Lord. They're set apart for the Lord. They shall come into the treasury of the Lord. Now, we're looking at this period of time before the temple was built. We normally think of the temple treasury uh, in the days of David and Solomon when the temple was built. But obviously, they still had the ark. Now, they did have a location for, for a short period of time for the ark at um, the uh, Gilgal. And so the treasury of the Lord's house may have been associated with the house at Gilgal. And we see that later on. We won't turn there, but Joshua 9.23. So the, these spoils of war are set apart for the Lord and the temple treasury, or the treasury of the Lord here. Now, verse 20 so the people shouted when the priests blew the trumpets. And it happened when the people heard the sound of the trumpet, and the people shouted with a great shout that the walls fell down, straight down, fell down flat. <clears throat> then the people went into the city, and every man straight before him, and they took the city. Now, notice observation here. Um, the people went up into the city. You see that in verse 20? Went up into the city. As we said, there's a 40 foot, 46 foot uh, advance and elevation. And so they went up into the city to take it. It wasn't just walls fell down, they walked just wide in, you know, like on flat ground. They had to go up. The text does say they went up into the city uh, and took it. Now, um, 
the people blew the trumpets. We address those trumpets earlier. Uh, the shofar horn will be blown, by the way, when the Jews are regathered back to the land of Israel in the future tribulation period. Let's take a look at one further verse on that in Isaiah 27. Isaiah 27, verse 13. Isaiah 27, verse 13. So it shall be in that day that the great trumpet will be blown. They will come who are about to perish in the land of Assyria to those who are outcast in the land of Egypt and shall worship the Lord in the holy mount at Jerusalem. This is in connection, by the way, with Matthew 24, verse 31. He's going to regather his children from all around the world with the sound of a trumpet. This is not the rapture. This is a trumpet for regathering Israel back to the land. That's interesting that there was a trumpet blown with the initial advancement into the promised land. And one day there's going to be a trumpet blown to regather the children of Israel back to the land. I found that really interesting to notice their first experience of victory in the land was sounded forth by a trumpet. And one day that the children of Israel will be gathered back to the land with a sound of a trumpet. All right. Now, they had to go up uh, to enter into the city, uh, as we saw in verse 20. Verse 21, uh, when they utterly destroyed all that was in the city, both men and women, young and old, ox and sheep, and donkey with the edge of the sword, uh, they utterly destroyed all that was in the city, uh, men and women, young and old, ox and sheep, donkey with the edge of the sword, complete annihilation. Now, the question arises at this point, isn't this cruel isn't this, uh, you know, doesn't this reflect on God as a mean tyrant? Uh, God is not fair, he's not just, and killing everyone uh, in this city? And the answer would be no, for several reasons. A uh, question arises, was Joshua justified in exterminating the population of Jericho? Um, the answer is no. Uh, back, and we won't look at this text, but Genesis 15, 16 he promised that the wickedness of the Amorites have not yet, is not yet full. Um, God allowed a period of over 400 years for the wickedness of that land to continue to grow before he judged. And in essence, he was giving them opportunity of their being spared. Remember, Rahab took that opportunity. Rahab was physically kept alive because she believed. God. God didn't want those people to perish, but they were in so re much rebellion against God that they were ripe for judgment. God did not judge that area until they were ready for judgment. Understand that. Um, and it took over 400 years for the evil to progress to a point to where it was absolutely destructive uh, for the children of Israel. Now, um, Secondly, the destruction of Jericho was far, far smaller an affair than the annihilation of the inhabitants of Sodom and Gomorrah. We see that judgment in Genesis 19, 24 and 25. We know because of their gay culture, uh, gay actually gay pride, according to the book of Ezekiel, they were not only, the, not only the homosexual culture, but also the fact that they were proud and arrogant about it, and God hates pride, he judged the inhabitants of Sodom and Gomorrah in the five cities of the plain. Think about the universal flood. We had Noah's flood where he destroyed all of the earth's population. They became so wicked. Uh, the breakdown of marriage. We had the angelic uh, uh, infiltration uh, trying to attack the line of Christ. And God had to wipe out the entire human race. So in the past, before this account, we have greater occurrences of judgment on wicked individuals. Now, in every case, the baneful infection of degenerate idolatry and moral depravity had to be removed before Israel could safely settle down in these regions and set up a monotheistic law-governed commonwealth for a testimony to the one true God. Imagine the kind of civilization that they were about to set up. So this pagan evil culture had to be completely purged from their midst. 
before they could prosper and set up a law and order type of uh, 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 a, a reign or rule. The failure to carry through completely the policy of extermination of the, of the heathen and the land of promise led to more of a religious downfall of the 12 tribes in the days of the judges. So in the days of the judges, because they didn't obey this completely, we have everyone did what was right in his own eyes. We see the corruption that occurred because they didn't do this. God wanted to prevent them from becoming corrupt because of the pagan culture. And therefore, uh, that led to the rebellion of Israel. Uh, what about in our economy? Well, we, we deal differently with the culture. The Lord has given us not physical weapons, but the weapons of our war warfare are mighty through the pulling down of strongholds. 2 Corinthians 10, 4 and 5, Romans 6, 13. We have spiritual weapons. We have, you know, our weaponry mentioned Ephesians 6. So we battle against the evil of our culture by standing firm in the truth of God's word. And that is our battle. Our battle is not certainly to murder or uh, try to get the culture to change apart from salvation by grace through faith. That's not our agenda in the church age. Our agenda is a defensive agenda as we put on the weaponry of God's word. Now let's take a look at uh, verse 22. But Joshua said to the two men who spied out the country, get out of the harlot's house and from there bring out the woman and all that she has as you swore to her. The young men who have been spies went in and brought out Rahab, her father, her mother, her brothers, all that she has. So they brought her out uh, out all her relatives and left them outside the camp of Israel. And then they went on and burned the city and all that was in it with fire. Only the silver and gold, the vessels of bronze, they put into the treasury of the house of the Lord. Joshua spared Rahab the harlot, her father's household and all that she had. So she dwells in Israel to this day. So dating of the book of Joshua indicates that uh, Rahab was still alive in that lifetime. Why she was alive? Because she hid the messengers from Joshua sent the spy out to Jericho. Now, it's interesting, the story of Rahab. I have here a family tree, so to speak. And one thing I want to point out that we have in the New Testament, Matthew 1, 5, Rahab married Salmon. Now, S-A-L-M-O-N. We don't have any other biblical record of who this guy was other than what we have in Matthew 1, 5. But there, there is extra biblical tradition uh, who, that states that this may have been, Rahab may have married one of the two spies. It's possible. Some say Joshua, but no, I don't really buy that. A lot of Jewish culture said Joshua, but more than likely one of the two spies. One was named Salmon. Now, either way, though, we have... The uh, outcome of that union was Boaz, and of course, uh, Ruth's mother-in-law was Rahab. Just want to point that out in Matthew 1.5. So there's a spiritual heritage. When we get to the story of Ruth, we have the spiritual heritage of a woman of faith, Rahab. And uh, so it really tells you the rest of the story there. Now, let's finish out the chapter. Uh, we have... Uh, a couple more verses to go here. Uh, Joshua charged him at that time, saying, Cursed be the man before the Lord who rises up and builds the city of Jericho. He shall lay his foundations with his firstborn, with his youngest. He shall set up his gates. So the Lord was with Joshua, and his fame spread throughout all the country. Now, this command about rebuilding the city of Jericho, the word there er in the Hebrew, uh, bana, B-A-N-A-H, means to build fortified cities. It didn't say you could, you, you're forbidden to occupy or build a home in Jericho. He said simply, do not re-fortify it. We know that the city of Jericho was given to the Benjamites in Joshua 18.21, so they lived there. But do not make Jericho a fortification again, or otherwise there will be a curse. And by the way, we do have that later in 1 Kings 16.34, there were two individuals who attempted to rebuild the fortifications of Jericho's uh, walls and it cost them their lives. So the fulfillment of this prophecy is found later in 1 Kings 16.34. This was violated, this command was violated 500 years later. 500 years later, 
This curse came upon two individuals who tried to refortify Jericho. Now, the Lord was with Joshua, as he promised, by the way, before he went into the land. He's still there, and his fame spread throughout all the country. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this account. We pray, Father, that uh, we might be individuals of faith. We might continue to walk by faith and not by sight. And we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen.